Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to season three of the Profit Power Hour. Man, we've been doing this for three years. Cool stuff. So thankful that you guys are joining us today and excited to kick off 2024 with all of you on a topic that is really near and dear to Jordan and myself. And uh, as I said in my promo email, might be the most unpopular, but I'm convinced will be the most important webinar of the year that we do. And so I really want to thank you for joining us today. Um, we're talking about how to double your enterprise value this year. The key is not what you think. And this is episode one of the Profit Power Hour. And really, I think we'll lay the foundation for what we're going to talk about throughout the year on the Profit Power Hour. And also for the things that um, Profit Coach and Lead Simple are working on as well throughout the year. Well, we have uh, a lot to cover today, and I just want to thank you again for joining us live on today's show. Love to hear where you're tuning in from, so jump into chat and tell us uh, where you're tuning in from, as well as one thing that you're excited about this year. Where you're joining in from and one thing that you're excited about in 2024 it could be on the personal side it could be professional it could be a goal it could be a vacation that's coming up is one thing that you're excited about in 2024 and uh, of course uh joining us today is um as we like to refer to each other my brother from another mo mother jordan muela uh <laughs> Brother from another mother, I got that out. Uh, Jordan Muela, CEO of Lead Simple and uh, founder here at Profit Coach as well. And myself, author of the Narbonne Accounting Standards, founder and CEO at Profit Coach. And we help uh, PMs expand their entrepreneurial freedom by building highly profitable self-managing companies. And as I like to say, more important than that, I am the grateful and proud dad of these kiddos and thankful to be married to my amazing wife, Megan. That's one thing I'm excited about uh, this year in 2024 is uh, another year of marriage to Megan, just learning to uh, uh, enjoy and appreciate the blessing of, of marriage even more this year. All right. Well, guys, uh, if you have questions, we really want to make this interactive as we go along here. And uh, if you want to jump into the conversation, uh, we encourage you to do that through the chat box. But if you have a specific question that you want to throw at us uh, today, please go ahead and dump that into the uh, Q&A box so we can make sure that we get all of uh, those questions answered for you. Thanks so much for joining everybody. Denny Miller from sunny Arizona, Patty Boykin from North Carolina, Jeremy uh, a uh, from Tampa, Florida, excited for more RTMs. I like that. Um, Callie, excited for more travel. Thank you, Karen. I'm excited for some travel this year. We are uh, planning some trips this last week. It's going to be fun. Um, Scott from Buffalo, thanks for joining. Got your daughters getting married this year. That's awesome. Love that. Congratulations. Lots to be grateful for. Um, Steve Shannon, Houston, Texas, improving our service while reducing the stress on our team. That's a good go. Hey, Charles. Your son's getting married. So lots of lots of lots of weddings coming up this year for people in the house. Awesome. Well, as always, the purpose of the Profit Power Hour is it's more about it's more it's about more than just profit. It's about facilitating a transformation of thinking, a transformation of mindset um, to move from financial fog to financial clarity, but not just financial fog to financial clarity, just from fog to clarity in general in every aspect of our business and life, and ultimately to move from uh, you know gut-based decision-making to predictable forecasting and from mediocrity to predictable and benchmark success. So what does that look like for you in 2024? I don't know what that looks like, but are you ready to engage the conversation? Are you ready to make 2024 your best year ever? We're going to talk about how to double your enterprise value this year. And we're going to come at this from uh, a, a unique and, and special angle that means a lot to Jordan and myself. And as we think about doubling our enterprise value, certainly we think about things that we talk about all the time here on the Profit Power Hour related to the six games that drive financial performance, the game of profit, the game of labor, the game of pricing, the game of growth, the game of experience, the game of expense management. And all of those things are important, but we want to go a level deeper here. 
um, and, 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 and move beyond just like, okay, yeah, if you're going to double your enterprise value, then certainly, you know, you got to increase your profitability. And we certainly agree with that going from, you know, the average of, you know, 11% profitability to the benchmark of 32% profitability and moving all of the levers of churn, labor efficiency and revenue per unit in your business. Of course, that's going to help with that. But even more fundamentally, We've been asking the question at Profit Coach, and I know, Jordan, you've been asking this question of, okay, when it comes to business, how do you create maximum value? Like, what, what, what is the source of value creation? How does that work in our businesses? How is that going to work in your business in 2024? If you want to double your enterprise value, then how do you create value? Jordan? Great, great tee up. Am I supposed to have, yeah. a, have a clear answer? How do we how do we create maximum value? You know, the way to create maximum value is to make sure that you're intending to create maximum value. A lot of it starts with intention. I heard yeah. Elon say one time that every company, every person in your company is a vector. A vector has a um, a velocity and a direction. And the tra trajectory of your company is the sum of all vectors. All vectors, mm -hmm. meaning, if half the people are headed in one direction, the other half are headed in the other direction, you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Getting people on the same page about what you're up to and what you're aiming at in a way that is not just correlated to the fact that they make a paycheck and they're doing what they're told, but there's actually some intention and meaning. That's the way to start creating maximum value. Yeah, love it. And, you know, for me, this journey has arrived at, a, 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 I would say, a little bit of a destination of like a, a belief around how I create maximum value and what the mission of Profit Coach is as a result of that. And that is for us at Profit Coach, and I think I've shared this on webinars in the past, and I know this is true for the mission at Lead Simple. Our mission is to help people become and achieve more than they thought possible. And really, Jordan, to use your example of that quote from Elon Musk around the individual vectors, like if, if the sum of your company value is the sum of those individual vectors, then how do you create more value in your companies by maximizing the individual vectors of each of uh, the, 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 the potential, potential of each of those individual vectors? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to unpack this. I'm going to take you through a little bit of my personal journey around how I came to this realization, because I got to tell you, I didn't start business thinking to myself, man, I'm going to wake up today to help people become and achieve more than they thought possible. Right. And so I want to take you on the journey of what we call BAM here at Profit Coach, which is the phrase that we use to summarize become and achieve more, bam, become and achieve more. And what does that look like for um, a company? What does that look like for a team? What does that look like for you this year? I really think that this is the, at the essence of how we create maximum value. And for Profit Coach, like practically speaking, what we're thinking about this year as we're going into 2024 is how do we create maximum value for our clients? Well, we think we, we create maximum value for our clients by helping your people become and achieve more so that they can help other people become and achieve more. And we do that for our team, you do that for your team, and the results are exponential. But practically, like, what does that look like? I wanna walk you through um, this journey of my entrepreneurial career that I uh, consider uh, to be meaning 1.0, meaning 2.0, meaning 3.0. And for me, um, meaning 1.0 was I wanted to start a business to create a passive residual income so that I could fund what I considered to be like the areas of my life outside of business that I would get more meaning. And for me, that would have been family and nonprofit work. Um, and so for me, I wanted to create a profitable business that was self-sustaining, that could run without me and could fund meaning in other areas of my life. And so um, I want to put up a, ch uh, a, 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 a question here for everybody to to contribute to in chat. And I'd like to just pull up the chat box and as you think about like what you want out of your business this year, what is the biggest, most long shot result that you're looking to achieve in 2024? 
Because let's face it, like having a profitable, successful business does actually fund a lot of meaning in our lives. And as it relates to 2024, there's probably some goal that you're looking to achieve, whether it's, hey, we want to add 360 doors this year, or we want to double our revenue per unit, or I want to expand my team size by 10, or we want to improve our conversion rate by 25 you know, points, some crazy goal. Like what is the biggest, most long shot goal that you're looking to achieve in 2024? All right. Um, come on, everybody. Uh, I've got uh, some feedback from Peter, improve profitability without reducing service. Can you make it even more specific? That's great. Like I want to improve profitability by 10 points. Um, we got Denny Miller, a vibrant, motivated, capable, and engaged leadership team. Mm. I love that. Um, mm. um, Alex Pearson, I'm looking to scale versus grow. Ooh, that's interesting. I'd like to hear that one a little bit more. Tease that out. Um, but But think about this, like, what is the biggest, most long shot result you're looking to achieve? Ed Riggenbach, improved profit per unit by 20 bucks. Jeremy, daily R to three. Shirley, replace all your uh, uh, local team to remote team members. Okay. <laughs> I hope your local team isn't on the call today. Um, no. Um, so this is some great things. What I want to ask you is what's going to drive that in your business this year? And Jordan, I want to talk a little bit about specifically um, this idea of, okay, you've got these goals. Meaning 1.0 starts with getting clear, getting honest. Where am I at really? What do I really want? Can you unpack a little bit about your journey around results, forecasting, predictability, measuring, and actually achieving in this area of kind of profitability and growth for your business? Yeah. So I just had a leadership team on site and at that leadership team on site, we talked about our shift towards results and using results as a way to get clear on what present reality is. And a lot of that just likes owning the results. If I, if, if I had a goal and I don't hit the goal, then I clearly wasn't quite aiming at the goal. I was aiming at something else other than the goal. There was something else that was more high value than actually accomplishing the goal and owning that and being really honest rather than mm -hmm. caught in a complaint or a delusion of like something stopped me, something prevented me as opposed to, you know what? I really wasn't actually aiming at it. I was aiming somewhere else. That was a segue for us to talk about what accountability looked like at the company early on when it was just me and my co-founder. And I mm -hmm. thought about the first spreadsheet, the first like goal spreadsheet that we ever had where we set a target and these things we were going to do. And guess what? None of them happened. <laughs> we didn't ha hit any of the targets. And month after month, we would have this depressing conversation where we didn't want to go in the meeting. We didn't really want to look at it. And maybe some of you on this call have experienced or felt that. And when I think back about what I was aiming at, other than the goal in that phase of my in that phase mm. of my life, I was aiming at avoiding the fact that Chris and I, my partner at that time, we were the ones that were, were that were driving the outcome, and we weren't fully committed. I was hedging. There was a lot of hedging. I was playing small. I was playing not to lose rather than playing to win, which would have required me to go all out, to call my shot, to plant a flag in the ground. And I wasn't comfortable or willing to do that. And therefore, of course, the, the results didn't show up because I wasn't really intending to actually hit those results. I wasn't willing to put myself at stake to accomplish what I said I was. That And that's kind of what where 1.0 was at. It was just about the money. There wasn't, a lot, there wasn't enough money. I didn't really need the money. And so it was, it was easier to just protect myself by playing small at that time. That's kind of where I started in business. Yeah. I certainly didn't start with BAM or any of this meaning stuff. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. And by the way, I know this goes without saying, but like, we're not experts on this stuff. We are in the middle of this journey and hopefully exactly. you guys are game for joining this journey along with us. It's um, messy. Yeah, it's messy. Jordan. Um, so you talked about hedging versus making commitments. And what I've got down here on the slide is, you know, meaning 1.0 starts with getting clear, honest, where am I really, what do I really want? Um, and then you talked about commitments. Um, like when you say hedging, what does that mean? How would you know if you're hedging? Um, and talk, unpack a little bit more this, this difference of, you know, um, intention and, and what, what that actually means in terms of a commitment. 
Hedging just means not putting yourself at stake, having something that you want, but un being unwilling to verbalize it because of the possibility of failure. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think about what this looked like for me, and probably for most of you guys, if you're on these calls, if you're following this journey, if you've been paying attention to profit, et cetera, many of you are in a place where the money doesn't really matter, or at least it doesn't matter enough for you to put mm -hmm. yourself on the line. The dichotomy of success is the further that you, the further that you get, the less each incremental dollar is going to mean for you in terms of extracting meaning from it. So we all start with this from the survival place of, if I could just, I just got to figure it out. I got to provide for my family and the <laughs> scrappiness and the hunger there is really helpful and motivating, but it doesn't become a fuel that is sufficient later on the journey. You've got to find something else. And the key for me was realizing that the goal, the point of the goal was not to achieve a financial target. The yeah. point of the goal was that I was putting myself at stake in a way that it would call something out of me yeah. around becoming mm -hmm. and that I can just do indefinitely. And, and the money is a, the money is the byproduct, but the money is not the point in that scenario. The growth is the point. And that I really yes. will do for the rest of my life. And, and that, that we're going to talk about meaning 2.0 in just a moment, but that was my experience hundred percent. Like Jordan, I remember those initial planning meetings when we were setting out the future of profit coach and like, Hey guys, are we going to do this? Are we going to start this business? Are we going to commit? And, um, we set out this, you know, financial goal and, you know, year one didn't happen. Year two didn't happen exactly the way I was planning or even close. Year three didn't happen. And I'm like, all right, meaning 1.0 isn't exactly occurring for me. So why am I in this? And that's what brought me to meaning 2.0. We'll talk about that in just a second, in just a second. But I want to hit one more thing on meaning 1.0, because at the end of the day, like there is some, there is some functional um, opportunity here for everyone as they think about that biggest thing that they're wanting to achieve this year. You put it in chat and Oftentimes when I'm coaching clients or certainly when I'm looking at my own forecast results, there's this temptation as I look at results to just, you know, well, this happened because of this, this was outside of our control. This isn't really what it seems to be um, like, Hey, yeah, we had some churn this year, but eh, I don't know that that's really saying anything about uh, the quality of the coaching or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to not necessarily get really close to the thing that the results are telling me about. Um, and I think what that is, is like, what do these results say about me? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's uncomfortable. Um, so talk a little bit about you, you, when we we're preparing for this call, you talked a little bit about this, um, the whole ability and willingness to call a shot and then to look at the results and see what they say about me. You know, the leadership team that I have right now is all in different places in their growth journey, et cetera. And the leadership team is a reflection of me. This whole thing that we're talking about is much less like a cognitive piece of knowledge and more like a posture that has to be actively held. And the moment that you yeah. stop holding it, you're no longer doing it. So my leadership team is a reflection of me and my leadership team is at different places in their level of maturity, specifically around agency, the ability to exert agency, which is to say viewing that it's the idea of blaming yourself, not as a way to self flagellate and generate penance or guilt, but as a way to empower yourself. If I behave my way into yeah. this circumstance, I can behave my way out of it. And the opposite that is externalizing. This is what a lot of folks are drawn towards is looking at the external circumstances as being the determinative factor and fixating on those things, fixating on mechanics and techniques, et cetera. And a lot of that is a way to avoid looking internally and really questioning your own intention. And mm -hmm. that to me has just been the biggest shift in leadership here. And, and, and this whole idea of like calling a shot there's a certain vulnerability that if you say, I can do this, I will do this, and you fully commit, that if you actually make that commitment, you're going to have to evaluate yourself relative to that commitment on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to, as, as, you, as, as we think about 2024, like meaning 1.0, this isn't where we want to land this conversation today. But as you think about those things that you put in chat, like 
where, where, where am I re with regard to what you put in chat, right? Like some of you said, Hey, I want to have a high performing leadership team. Where are you really today? And, and what do you really want with regard to that leadership team? And what are you willing to sacrifice for that? And then as you go through the year, what are your results relative to what you said you wanted? And what do those results say about me or say about you? That's a powerful conversation for expanding Meaning 1.0. And it really leads us to Meaning 2.0. And for me, Meaning 2.0 came about, as I mentioned, when I wasn't exactly getting the results at the profitability, financial revenue, growth level, I began to ask myself, okay, so what is, what is in this? Like, why am I doing this? And I realized, well, I'm not necessarily achieving everything that I wanted to in the business. That's important. I'm getting there. But what's happening in the meantime is even more significant. And that's that I'm changing. I'm becoming. I'm actually growing. And that's a tremendous, tremendous value to me. And so as, as we think about this, I want to put up a poll here. And um, I would really love some feedback for you as you think about that thing that you put into chat, the biggest, most long shot goal or result that you have for 2024. What's the most likely reason your biggest 2024 objective will fail? So jump into the poll and I love some feedback. This is gonna be interesting. What's the most likely reason your biggest 2024 objective will fail? Um, tough economy or market, underperforming operations team, bad systems or technology, underperforming leader slash CEO, bad processes, not enough leads, underperforming sales marketing team, government regulation, underperforming leadership team, or other. All right, it'll be interesting. Um, so what is Meaning 2.0? Meaning 2.0 was for me, my, my, my personal becoming and achieving. And um, this really starts with agency. And Jordan, you were talking about this a little bit, um, but I want to unpack this just a, a, a little bit more. And, you know, one of the things that I remember from my coaching experience, one of my first coaching calls, uh, I had a conversation with a business owner. We're going over the fact that they were below zero in profitability. And we were trying to analyze this and sort of we had this epiphanal moment where the client recognized what he thought was the essence of the problem with his business. And he summarized that essence by saying, people are crap. And he didn't use the word crap, okay? <laughs> and that was his essence of what was going on in the business. And I, and I, I continue to have conversations, not just with other people, but with myself. Um, mm -hmm. I, can, mm -hmm. I can remember, you know, the, just, just a couple of weeks ago, um, sort of this sort of like high and mighty, ah, these people just don't get it attitude. And I just <laughs> take the stick into that room and whip those people into shape. Um, and hopefully those impulses don't last very long, but that's what was coming out of me. And I remember one particular conversation where I got some feedback on my leadership that I really thought was unfair. This is, um, yeah. Not, 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 not terribly long ago. And I sort of had that self-righteous impulse, you know, mm -hmm. well, what mm -hmm. this says is more about the person that's giving the feedback than it says about me. Right. And the feedback may or may not have been justified, but my business partner, my brother, um, who's my older brother, um, sort of like, you know, all right, take a chill pill. Like Danny, you're missing the whole point here. Like, even if you don't exa exactly agree with what this person is saying about you, what is it that you're doing that's creating that experience for them? And would you be interested in knowing? And are you actually interested in getting close enough to understand how you might be contributing at least to that perception? That's a recent mm -hmm. example for me mm -hmm. um, of where I was exhibiting low agency around that problem. Jordan, any other thoughts on this? Yeah. I mean, it's always when it hooks you, whatever hooks you, you know, there's something there for you. And the agency thing, it's really made up. But the bottom line is that in certain relationships, we're going to be more apt to cede our personal control and authority. I know for me personally, in my business partner relationships, I'm more 
for whatever reason, I'm more apt to do that. I'm more apt to tell myself that this person, that I'm not going to get what I want. This person is going to say this, and then I'm going to say that. I'm having a fake debate in my head that I use as the justification for pretending that I actually talk to them. And therefore, based on this fake pretend conversation I had, I'm not, it's not going to go the way I want. So I'm not actually even going to have the conversation with them. Yeah. I mean, guys, this is, this is just the human experience, right? The deeply yeah. irrational human experience, but I'm more inclined to go there with some people rather than others. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter who or why what's important is to recognize that that's, that's on me. That's not yeah. on the other person. So When I'm going to this place of, of low agency, I, I am trying to recognize what's happening. That doesn't mean I don't have the feelings or sensations, but at least recognize that's the thing I need to walk toward, not run away from. And the more of that stuff I'm willing to walk toward and look at, generally speaking, that correlates to me getting more of what I want out of life. Yeah. All right. Here's the poll results. Um, interesting stuff. Um, why, what is most reason, what is the most likely reason your biggest 2024 objective will fail? Um, 4% say it's the, the, the economy market, 13% underperforming operations team, 2% bad systems, 15% underperforming leader or CEO, 17% bad processes, 6% not enough leads, 8% underperforming sales and marketing team, no, gov all right. Hey, we live in a free country. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, um, and then 23% underperforming leadership team um, and 12% other. Now that's really interesting because I would mm -hmm. say that that very much reflects recent conversations that I've had. And um, we're going to dive into that. Um, Jordan, like there's this interesting, this juxtaposition between underperforming leader versus underperforming leadership team. Um, do you want to like any, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So this really gets at the heart of the idea of intention versus mechanism. If you think about the inputs that will solve a problem for you, some of those inputs are mechanical in nature, the strategy, the tactics, the approach all the intellectual stuff that I personally find very satisfying. There's that. And the other half is just your intention of like, what were you committed to? How committed to you were you, were you solving the problem? If you think about what percentage of an outcome is driven by the intention and what percentage of the outcome is driven by the mechanism or the mechanics, everybody is going to be in a different place. In fact, right, right now, guys, what, what's the split? What's your gut? When solving hard problems, what percent is determined by intention and what per, what percent is determined by mechanism? Type in chat what your gut take on that is. For the first the first number is intention, the second number is mechanism. So 50-50 mm -hmm. would be 50% intention, 50% mechanism. Denny, yeah, so intention, Chris Freeberg, 80-20. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. This is this would be like we go into a profit conversation, and all day long we've got mechanism stuff to talk about. Danny, this was the first epiphany for me and you early yeah. on was we got really clear there was a lot to talk about in terms of the mechanics and the DLER and the labor and the churn and the ACV etc. And what 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 got really clear is we would get into conversations where we would serve up based on our experience exactly what would need to happen, and then it wouldn't happen. Right. Nothing would change. Yeah. Right. And that's when it became clear. It was not the mechanism. If the, the mention, mechanism cannot overcome the intention in my world, it's a hundred percent intention. If you are intending to do the thing, you will figure out the mechanism. And yeah. I've had many a moment in my life where I came to someone with what felt like a really hairy pressing problem and what they reflected back to me was that I wasn't actually committed on solving the problem. Probably one mm -hmm. of the most profound experiences I had involved Steve Wealthy, where I brought to I brought to him something really um, serious and personal that felt heavy to me. And the question he asked me blew my mind. He asked me, have you actually thought about it? Danny, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I hadn't. I was avoidant. I was deeply avoidant with this thing. I didn't want yeah. to think about it. That's why yeah. it was a problem. Yeah. So I know that can sound, 
I know that can sound a little wild. Like, well, what about DLER? And what about all these other mechanisms that would require profit? Yeah, that stuff matters. But if your intention is to, if, if your intention and your commitment is not ironclad towards the thing that you're aiming at, that other stuff isn't going to get fixed. And if your intention yeah. is ironclad, you're going to find the person, you're going to find the resource, you're going to, you're going to figure it out. And so as you look at here, this poll and you look at these poll of results of like, what's going to get in my way, a lot of these answers are externalizing. Like I had this goal. I had this thing that was deeply, profoundly meaningful to me. I hope, I hope you're aiming at something that's really meaningful to you. And if it's not meaningful to you, that may be part of the problem that you put a goal out there yeah. that you don't actually feel a deep yeah. personal connection with. But if you did, you bet on black, you called your shot. Was, was bad process? Was that really the thing that was going to get in your way? Was bad technology? Was it an underperformed sales and marketing team? These are things that you will figure out if your commitment is all in, but it's really hard to get to the point of being all in unless you're clear enough that this thing matters to you beyond just the incremental dollar. There's more that we can unpack. Yeah. This, this, uh, what's, I think the thing that was interesting to me about these poll results was the, you know, 15% said underperforming leader CEO, uh, 23% underperforming leadership team. Um, and I'm, I'm the CEO. I have to ask myself who's responsible for the underperforming leadership team. Mm -hmm. That would be me. Mm -hmm. And, um, what I, what I have experienced here is in fact, I, I had some conversations. I've had this conversation with myself. I had some conversations recently and the conversation went something like, um, uh, my leadership team feels like they're holding me back. And mm -hmm what that it, the the question that raises is like well holding you back from what hmm. and what is the real opportunity for you in that experience maybe the real opportunity is the breakthrough with the leadership team right hmm. maybe 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 it's not what's on the other side of a high performing leadership team but maybe the opportunity itself is the leadership team and if that's the opportunity then then that won't stand in your way so um, agency, where do I exhibit low agency around problems? And then becoming before achieving. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but what do I need to do? What do I need to become in order to achieve X? I, I've, mm -hmm. I found a, a flaw in my management in the last couple of years, and that's being overly results oriented in my management, um, being too focused on outcome versus process, being too focused on achieving versus being be becoming. Because you can get aberrant, you, you can use aberrant methods of behavior to get achievements over a short term that aren't sustainable. Mm -hmm. But that 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 will run out, that won't that won't work. And you have to go back to the becoming to the process in order to achieve that. And so as you think about that number one big thing for you this year, I want to encourage you to think about what 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 do you need to become what capabilities do you need to expand personally and as a team in order to achieve that one thing? Think about the becoming aspect as a way to get to the achieving of X. Now, meaning 3.0, I experienced this personal growth in my business. And as my posture and attitude started to change in business to growth, to people, I started to experience meaning 3.0. That's where we want to spend the rest of our time here today. And that is the ability to help other people become and achieve mm. even more mm. than they thought possible. So it's the business, then it's me, and then it's, wow, I can actually help other people do this? That is awesome. And um, this, is, this is hairy, this is messy. It involves um, owning up to mistakes, humility, um, messing up, and certainly in my case, sin, hurting people, but it's an amazing opportunity to actually engage in things that have long lasting value and meaning. We're going to pack that here and we're hopefully going to give you some practical tools that will help you engage this BAM conversation with your team over the next 20 minutes. But I want to ask you to jump into chat one more time. And if you can be vulnerable, um, certainly don't, don't, don't use names if, uh, if those names are on the call with you, but what's the biggest challenge you're facing with your team 
or a specific person on your team? And put that in chat right now, if you don't mind. Um, what's the biggest challenge you're facing with your team right now or a specific person on your team? And we'd like to interact with you guys on this and 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 um, get in the messiness with you for a little bit over the next 20 minutes. But meeting 3.0 starts with uh, viewing people rightly. Um, again, people aren't crap. Um, they're not tools. They're made in the image of God. They have inherent meaning and worth and value. Jordan, you talked to me the other day about this whole idea of using people as tools. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah. So this, some of this language can sound, um, loaded. It can sound moral in nature. And guys, my focus really here is on, on <laughs> my focus is on results. The result that I want to produce is helping people be become and achieve more than they think possible. Yeah. So the people are the result that I am trying to facilitate. The people are the mission. And because the yeah. people are in the mission, I feel good about pressing and putting weight on it. I'm not pressing, trying to squeeze dollars out of people. That doesn't feel good. I'm trying to squeeze life, health, and abundance for my people with dollars being the byproduct around it. When I think about the way I've used people as tools, the number one way I've done it is when I've given up on someone. I've come to the conclusion, it's clear to me, this ain't going to work out. However, I need your labor. I need you to keep producing the thing that you're producing. And um, mentorship? Nope, not anymore. Uh, belief? Nope, not anymore. We're just going to kind of tolerate you until I can find some find somebody better. And that see that is it's a devil's bargain, guys. This last week, I had I had one of my top performers, one of one of my absolute top performers, begging me to do this, just prostitute so and so just a little longer, just squeeze a little more juice out of them, and then we can toss them to the side. And it's really really hard because the results, the thing that we want to squeeze out of them, it's of use. It is need them. It is inconvenient to find somebody else. But what's not obvious is what we create when we do that. We tell the top performers, hey, we'll actually tolerate non-performance. You know, we will. I'm going to expect it of you as an A player. But these other people, ah, eh, they could screw around. We'll still keep them around. That's toxic. A performers yeah. will resent that fact and they'll be tempted to use that to excuse their own behavior. Um it sets the precedent that we write people off and we we under we don't invest in them. Guys, it just feels gross. It's me prostituting myself, using somebody for their labor with no real commitment towards them in a in in work, in a relationship. That obviously just isn't gonna do anything well. And having having done it, I can tell you, Mike, I'm really clear on committing to not doing it, not just because it feels gross, but it just produces a lot of dysfunction in the business. Yeah. Um, not too long ago, I had someone come to me and, uh, say, you know, I'm, I'm not totally sure that I can trust that you're going to make business decisions with my best interest in mind. Mm. And, um, that hurt. Um, and what I have been thinking about is the way that I do use business or use the, 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 the work environment to make me look good. And, uh, and, and, and what I'm getting at here is like using other people and their performance around like my own self-satisfaction with my own performance and like using other people to actually, uh, create an environment where I think I did a good job and I'm, 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 I'm happy with what I did. Um, and so what that looks like is in certain relationships, um, certain circumstances, it's, um, not actually looking at the situation or the problem with the view of helping them put their best foot forward. Like, and this comes back to the whole externalizing blaming thing, right? Oftentimes I'm trying to like in a conversation, save face and not put help, not, not help them put their best foot forward or not help them actually um, 
maximize the opportunity of their becoming in a particular situation. So that's one way I think I use, uh, I've seen myself doing that. And the challenge for me <clears throat> that, that came out of that conversation was, um, again, stop using people as a means to an end. How can I make this about them? How can I help them get in the best seat for their best outcome, for their best success and their best satisfaction at work? That was one recent experience. So viewing people rightly and then getting close um, I kind of talked a little bit about that gut visceral reaction when I heard that feedback. It was like, I don't want to hear this. And I was on a, I was listening to a podcast from Dan Dakini recently. Jordan, you guys obviously work with Dan a lot. And his feedback was what you resist persists. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I realized was that when I have a problem, I usually end up doing one of two things, tolerating or resisting. And the the both of those impulses come from this desire to like stay away from the messiness mm -hmm. and not get close. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we want to talk about how do you get close? But Jordan, like, what's been your experience there, um, moving from avoidance toleration to actually leaning in and getting close to the thing that is the problem? Yeah, it's happened slowly over time, and I've been more persuaded by the physics of this situation, just the observable phenomenon that the thing I won't look at is typically the thing that'll defeat me. The thing that I'm too uncomfortable to face is the thing that I understand the least, that is the most apt to um, be unknown and produce dysfunction because I just, I can't, I can't be with it. I can't put my arms around it, whether or not that's a certain conversation with a team member or a structural shift in the business that's needed that I know is going to upset certain people. My inability to look at that stuff definitely tends to gym things up. And I think these answers that you guys are, are giving, um, are great. Let's go through some of these, um, Rick Ellis, my personal motivation. That's a great one. I had a mentor tell me one time, you're bored. This was maybe four years ago. I'm on a call with a mentor and he tells me you're bored. Man, did I not want to hear that. My first thought was like, screw you, I'm bored. You know? But then I thought about it more and I was like, oh yeah, I'm definitely bored right now. <laughs> I'm unfocused. I'm trying to find the next thing. And he was right. But at first... I absolutely resisted that because it was incongruent with my perception of myself. One of the biggest incongruence with me, guys, is conflict avoidance. It is deeply emasculating to me to tell you that I can be conflict avoidant. That doesn't fit with my identity of myself as like hard charging, type A, hard charger. That's in me. That's a part of me. The more I judge it, the harder it is for me to be with. When I just say, hey, you know what? That That's a part of me. It's a part of the wonderful human that I am made in the image of God. And it comes with that. That allows me to look at it and be with it more. <laughs> Let's look more of these answers. Arrested Development, great TV show. Not entirely what, sure what that means in this context. Brad Randall, being 100% clear and communicating vision clearly, well, easily understood. So they cannot read my mind. Okay, that's great. That's a great one, Brad. Being clear about communicating the vision. Here's a great question for everybody. What are you up to if you're not currently clear about communicating the vision? If you're not, if your team isn't clear, that clearly was what you were aiming at. You were aiming at being unclear. Why? What might you be getting out of that? Try to hold that with neutrality and openness. For me, not being at risk. This whole mission that we have, that this mm. mission that we describe is the mission for lead simple. It's the mission for profit coach. We didn't start that way. I've had some hesitation about bringing this forward for a couple of different reasons. It triggers the cynicism. Man, well, is, it, is anybody going to believe that? Is it real? Is it true? What if people don't believe it? What you if know, you're what a hypocrite? If, what if What if I'm a hypocrite? Which happens like every other day. <laughs> what if What if people think it's a cult, et cetera? It requires me to put myself at risk. So Brad, one thought is like, what have you been up to? What were you aiming at? When you weren't clear previously, there's some, some reflection, Karen Jordan, um, not taking people, not taking initiative. That one's great. Not taking initiative. You know, what are we, what are we up to when we allow for that team members not following through similar vein? So when, Patty, when, there's probably some frustration there. How many times has it happened thus far? Have you communicated along the way? And if you haven't communicated, why, what were you up to? What were you getting out of not communicating about that? That kind of self-reflection and introspection, I've found really helpful. 
certain t- Todd, certain members are maxed out, but they're maxed out below the level. I feel they should be achieve, uh, achieving. Well, Todd, the good news is I'm going to assume here that you're the business owner, which means that you have the prerogative of setting the standard. My yeah. experience is what's helpful is to get their buy-in to yeah. get a mutual agreement about what we're aiming at so that accountability starts feeling less like putting your thumb down on people to make them do things they don't want to do. And instead you taking a stance and a posture to stand with them towards a goal that they committed to, that they see value in, that they believe advances their life and their well being, uh, not just makes us money. Story on that. I mean, this is, this is really like the whole compliance versus competency mindset. Like, Um, do you want an organization that complies with your standard of achievement or an organization that sets the standard and, and defines what they think they can achieve? We want to get to some practical, um, tools, Jordan, you were super practical, but some frameworks for unpacking these conversations. How do you create the space? And for having these kinds of conversations that are actually going to, create this kind of possibility of becoming and achieving more than you thought possible in your organization. And I just summarize it this way. Like, how do you create the space? There's different ways to create space. Um, One of them is tell your team the conversations you're going to have that might be new and unfamiliar and Mm -hmm. uncomfortable, and then tell them why you're going to have them. And I've experienced so much power from just like saying, uh, we're going to start asking ourselves and each other these awkward questions. So like that takes half the awkwardness away. Now we know it's coming and we're just doing it because we believe that this is actually going to help us achieve more and become more as individuals. And the other way, Jordan, as we were preparing for this, you said something else about creating the space, which was a much bigger aspiration around like what you're actually trying to achieve here around helping people. Can you unpack that just a little bit more? Like what has to be true in our mindset around what we're actually aiming at to have the space for these kinds of conversations. The reason that Danny was joking beforehand that this is going to be an unpopular webinar is because A, we're talking about leadership, which is a little less sexy than talking about how to make more money. And B, the type of leadership here is not skills and like a John Maxwell book. It's like looking in the mirror at yourself. In many ways, not popular, even though it's effective. For me, for the juice to be worth the squeeze, I needed to conceptualize something bigger around what I was up to with my leadership and what I envisioned for my people. And it really had to be a vision. First first off, it had to be ask myself, what am I willing to put myself at risk for in my business? And then asking myself, what vision need, what is a, a vision that is big enough that I can enroll my team into? If I'm trying to enroll people into this, which is going to be a whole bunch of hassle and it might not work and all these things could go wrong and it's a lot of effort and it's a bunch of introspection, I had to have something bigger I was aiming at to justify yeah. all of that effort. And it yeah. had to be big enough for it to include all of your team members. So that's something to be reflecting on is, do you have a clear and compelling vision that you feel drawn towards? And are do your team members feel that they are not a part of that? And if not, it's just really great to be really clear that that's what you're up to. It's, it's not um, one or the other. Um, but for me, for that meaning impulse, for me to keep getting up and driving hard, I really had to expand my vision for, for the organization, for the people. Yeah. We're going to talk about, as we wrap up here, two specific conversation frameworks that we are doing our best to employ at Profit Coach and Lead Simple that I think are going to give you like, um, you know, nails and hammer level application from this webinar. Um, Before we do that, I just want to offer some help to you guys this year as you begin 2024. Um, Where do you stand in relationship to clarity on your goals for 2024, your ability to commit to those goals and have a clear plan that gives you that affordance of commitment? Where are the opportunities for investing in people that are going to make Twenty a huge difference in 2024. Like, I mean, to the extent of actually doubling your enterprise value in 2024. One of the beautiful things about finance is that it's a lens for getting real with what's going on in your business. It's a way of actually seeing functionally, tangibly what's going on in your business. 
at the level of not just revenue per unit, DLER and churn, but then what are the people issues that are tying to those things that need to be addressed in order for us to achieve all of the financial goals we want. And so obviously use the NARPM accounting standards, get involved with the conversation, the framework to have that kind of clarity, get converted, get in the game of financial performance, see how you stack up to the latest benchmarks. But I want to offer you the ability to schedule a 2024 financial game planning session with our coaching team. And this is a little bit different. Um, we want to help you better understand your greatest threats and opportunities. Yes, from a financial perspective and discover the profit potential for 2024. But then we want to help you identify the top one to three BAM opportunities in your business right now that will help make 2024 your best year ever. How does it work? You send us your PL so that we can get that financial clarity. We walk through that with you, do some analysis, get clear on the financial results you're looking for relative to where you are, and then help you identify what those BAM opportunities are in your business and answer the question, what would have to be true of your team to accomplish X goal? So totally free. Would love to have you, this opportunity to have this conversation with you. And if this is something that you would find helpful, um, I'm going to relaunch that poll right there. Yes. Um, love to have this conversation. So if you want to get clear on what those top one to three BAM opportunities are for your org this year, um, just say yes. And we'd be happy and would love to have that conversation with you. Okay. So we're going to jump back to these conversation models here. And Jordan, um, I, I think it'll be a long time before I forget our leadership meeting uh nine months ago. And it probably wasn't one of my favorite quarterly planning meetings of all time, but we were hitting some, uh, some barriers in the conversation and we were getting a sense of a lack of buy-in. We like went around the room, like how optimistic are you about your role here at Profit Coach and the future? And, you know, got a couple of eights and then I got a four and then I got a six out of 10 and we realized, all right, we got to unpack some of what's going on here. And Jordan, um, you helped unpack that with this CCR conversation model. And I want to just have you walk us through this. How does this get used in real time and how can this open up possibilities in a business? Yeah, totally. So the CCR model stands for complaint, contribution, and request. And really simply, this is a way for you to do a judo move with bitching and complaining in your business. I am aspiring to get to a point where whatever happens in the business, it's perfect. It's great. I'm rolling with it. I can be with it. And complaints are one of those things where it triggers something in us. They're ungrateful. They don't get it. They're wrong. Let me tell them. I have found a model that has allowed me to be okay with the complaining and actually churn it into something much more useful. So step one is to give people permission in a structured, productive format to complain. List out the complaints, write down. And, and I, we did this uh, at Lead Supple at our last team, All Hands in Texas. And we just had everybody list out, list out their top complaints in the business about your manager, about your department, about the organization, about you know the CEO. Step two was your contribution. Step one, easy. People got that. I didn't have to explain it or do any coaching. Step two was difficult. And I actually had to repeat myself over and over and over again. I, I just, as an example, I asked somebody to articulate a contribution. Um, and the person that I called upon kept restating the complaint over and over and over again. And this, I'm in a room of like 60 people. Finally, by the third time, they got what I meant about contribution and they were able to, to outline a way in which their behavior contributed towards the complaint, the way that they created the thing that they're complaining about. And step three is request. What is the request, the unstated, unverbalized request up to this point, either of yourself or of someone else related to the complaint? This is what empowerment looks like. Rather than avoiding all of the complaining, rather than keeping it under the table where you know the complaints are there, but you're afraid to look at them, you're afraid to deal with them, you're afraid for them to come up in a public meeting, or if they do come up, you don't know what to do with them. You you feel defensive, like you have to resolve it or explain it. That's common. People will come up with complaints and you feel like that you're the one that has to fix it yeah. by virtue of the fact that they have a complaint. This empowers the person complaining 
to fix it themselves. And ultimately, if they're super unhappy, maybe it's it's not a fit or the best place for them to be. Um, but this is an empowerment model. An empowerment model. It's not a gimmick. This is something that I do. It's for me. This is what care looks like to slow down the conversation enough and to be neutral enough to have this kind of conversation in my organization, in Danny's organization, this is what care looks like. Yeah. I mean, and th think about this conversation, like someone that says, Hey, like, you know, X, Y, Z is going wrong. And when's the last time you've just like point blank said, okay, like formalize that complaint. And now what's your contribution? Like that feels like a really awkward question to ask, right? Mm -hmm. But when you formalize the conversation and and communicate the why behind it, it's amazing what you can have the opportunity to ask and uncover. So Jordan, love that. That was a tr transformative quarterly meeting. Seriously, I want to just thank you right now for facilitating that conversation. Um, it had a huge impact on our leadership team. Uh, and we're at a much different place today as a result of that. Um, the other framework is what we call the hey, BAM. Hey, 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 but before we do that, Chris's question is really significant. How do you prevent misconstruing this process as victim blaming? If somebody wants to construe, I, I just wouldn't worry about it. If somebody wants to construe it that way, they will. And it is what it is. This is rooted in empowerment. The way to prevent someone from construing this is you not telegraphing that by virtue of you not thinking that. If you experience this as care, and empowerment and you slow down the conversation and you're open-handed and neutral in your approach, somebody else will be able to feel that. If this feels like a subtle way to manipulate people and turn it around people and get a gotcha, they'll pick that up too. Back to posture. This isn't knowledge. This isn't technique. This is the posture and the intention that you're holding of what you're trying to create in the relationship. Good question. Um, we've taken and borrowed and begged and stole components of coaching questions and conversations from Jordan and other places. Like one of my favorite books is um, The Coaching Habit, Seven Questions That Will Transform the Way You Lead Forever. Fantastic book. Totally recommend The Coaching Habit. And taken those sources and it created our own conversation model that revolves around five questions in three areas, problem, context, and solution. And I want to just uh, walk through this real quickly um, as another framework of a conversation to get in the mess, get deep and really understand what's going on. Number one, what is the real challenge here for you? And what this does is promotes a conversation where we're going from surface level symptom analysis to much deeper root cause analysis. Yeah, that's great. I understand. But you know, when it comes to not having a le enough leads, what's the real challenge here for you? Um, well, you know, I just haven't gotten enough leads from the marketing department to do my job. Okay. So, but what is the real challenge here for you in relationship to that? Well, I, I don't have any other lead sources. All right. So what could that look like for you? Well, what that could look like is getting another lead source. Exactly. Right. So uh, helping people go deeper on what the real challenge is specifically for them and not externalizing the problem. And to that end, we've also integrated that question from Jordan's model, the CCR framework, in terms of what is your contribution to the current challenge? An honest look at what am I contributing as a way of empowerment? Probably my favorite question in the model is this one. And I think this gets to the question that Chris is asking, um, which is how do you actually communicate that this has their best interest in mind? And I love this question. Um, what do you want? Like, no, this isn't just about what the company wants. Like, hey, I really need you to do this because it's going to be good for the bottom line of the company and it's going to be good ultimately for your paycheck. No. What do you want? Like, let's set the company aside. Like, what, what do you want? Like, what do you really want out of this? Going deep to their personal desire around this particular situation. And then pivoting to, okay, if that's really what you want, what, what would have to be true to achieve this? And that then opens up a conversation of how do I align my interests with the interests of those around me? One of the breakthroughs that we had in our company um, on, a, on a personal level was someone uh, came and said, like, I am now for the first time seeing that like win-wins are actually possible. Like I've, I believed for a long time that if the company wins, it means I'm losing. And if I'm losing, if, if I'm going to win, it means the company's losing. But 
wow, I actually do believe that win-wins are now possible. And what would have to be true in order for a win-win to occur for me to get what I want and what other people want around me? And then lastly, how would you know if you achieved it? What are their measurable outcomes? So this is another way of getting into the challenge, helping take, uh, helping op open up an ownership conversation. And again, my favorite question here is like, what do you want? Such an arresting, powerful, transformative question that gets to people's motivations. And then once you've got that and you understand what's really in it for them, uh, amazing things begin to hop, happen and helping them become and achieve more than they thought possible around what they really want. All right, guys, hope these conversation models are helpful to you. And specifically, as we wrap up here, I just want to answer this question that might be lurking for some of you. And that is, okay, like at the end of the day, um, like how does, how does this actually work in my business um, as it relates to driving financial results? Jordan, you made this comment right before we we're getting on the webinar. I really want people to know they can have their cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? Having to pick between helping people and making an impact and making money, it's a false dilemma. It's a sucker's game. It feels gross and I don't want to do it. I thought I did have to pick for in my early in my career. Now I'm clear. I don't. And when you realize you can have both, wow. Wow. What an enabler. You know, it's made such a huge, it's made all the difference for me in my career. Yeah. And so as you think about like how does you know becoming and achieving more impact labor efficiency? Uh, impact churn, impact revenue per unit, impact expense management, growth, and enterprise value. Hopefully, like it's not hard to see that if you have a team that's doubling their internal capability, they're becoming and they're achieving, like doesn't all of this stuff sort of just take care of itself? Doesn't DLER start to just take off? Doesn't value creation take off and churn goes up and revenue per unit, sorry, churn goes down, revenue per unit goes up? Doesn't growth take off? when people are experiencing this personal growth. And ultimately, as you're able to have a sustainable, predictable way of creating an organization mm. that's mm. self-managing, self-multiplying, and can sustain value creation over time, doesn't enterprise value go up? So at the end of the day, Jordan, final thoughts as we wrap up with this thought of hold the pose in 2024. Can you go back one slide? Yeah. My reflection as you're saying this is reflecting on my journey with you, Danny. I feel like you and I figured out academically this stuff within what? Yeah. The first 12 or 18 months. It didn't take that long to get clear on the mechanics, but it's taken many years and really it'll be a lifetime to figure out this other stuff. Yeah. This is the easy part. The academics, the money management, the levers. Um, this is definitely the easier Part. They both, they both matter, but this, this leadership thing, that's, what's going to drive not only the long-term performance, but also the long-term meaning and connection. And that's, I think as close as you're going to get with legacy is like, how did people feel in the business? Did they feel cared for? Did they feel like you saw the dignity and the humanity in them and that you figured out a way to drive performance via that connection? <laughs> that's what I'm aiming at. Not easy. I'm screwing it up daily but it's what I'm aiming at guys. That's all I got. Our last thought is hold the pose in 2024, hold the posture. These are uh, certainly ideas that have to be incarnated into a daily mindset, a daily posture around those problems. Mm -hmm. The problems create the visibility around the opportunity, hold the posture, hold the pose as those problems surface. And I can guarantee that if you do that 2024, is going to go better than 2023 if you're focused even more on helping people become and achieve more than they thought possible. Here's to Bam from Profit Coach and Lead Simple. We'll be back with you in February for episode two of the 2024 Profit Power Hour series. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining right now today. We hope this has been helpful. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Peace.